If one wishes to advocate a free society, that is, capitalism, one must realize that its indispensable foundation is the principle of individual rights. If one wishes to uphold individual rights, one must realize that capitalism is the only system that can uphold and protect them. Rights are a moral concept, the concept that provides a logical transition from the principles guiding an individual's actions to the principles guiding his relationship with others. Individual rights are the means of subordinating society to moral law. Every political system is based on some code of ethics. The dominant ethics of mankind's history were variants of the altruist collectivist doctrine which subordinated the individual to some higher authority, either mystical or social. Consequently, most political systems were variants of the same status tyranny, differing only in degree, not in basic principle, limited only by the accidents of tradition, of chaos, of bloody strife and periodic collapse. Under all such systems, morality was a code applicable to the individual, but not to society. Society was placed outside the moral law as its embodiment or source or exclusive interpreter. Since there is no such entity as society, since society is only a number of individual men, this meant in practice that the rulers of society were exempt from moral law. Subject only to traditional rituals, they held total power and exacted blind obedience on the implicit principle of the good is that which is good for society or for the tribe, the race, the nation, and the ruler's edicts are its voice on earth. This was true of all statist systems under all variants of the altruist collectivist ethics, mystical or social. As witness, the theocracy of Egypt with the pharaoh as an embodied god, the unlimited majority rule or democracy of Athens, the welfare state run by the emperors of Rome, the inquisition of the late Middle Ages, the gas chambers of Nazi Germany, the slaughterhouse of the Soviet Union. All these political systems were expressions of the altruist collectivist ethics. And their common characteristic is the fact that society stood above the moral law as an omnipotent sovereign whim worshipper. The most profoundly revolutionary achievement of the United States of America was the subordination of society to moral law. The principle of man's individual rights represented the extension of morality into the social system as a limitation on the power of the state, as man's protection against the brute force of the collective. As the subordination of might to right, all previous systems had regarded man as a sacrificial means to the ends of others, and society as an end in itself. The United States regarded man as an end in himself, and society as a means to the peaceful, orderly, voluntary coexistence of individuals. All previous systems had held that man's life belongs to society. That society can dispose of him in any way it pleases, and that any freedom he enjoys is his only by favor, by the permission of society, which may be revoked at any time. The United States held that man's life is his by right, which means by moral principle and by his nature. That a right is the property of an individual. That society, as such, has no rights, and that the only moral purpose of a government is the protection of individual rights. A right is a moral principle defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. There is only one fundamental right; all the others are its consequences or corollaries. A man's right to his own life. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The right to life means the right to engage in self-sustaining and self-generated action, which means the freedom to take all the actions required by the nature of a rational being for the support, the furtherance, the fulfillment, and the enjoyment of his own life. Such is the meaning of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The concept of a right pertains only to action, specifically to freedom of action. It means freedom from physical compulsion, coercion, or interference by other men. Thus, for every individual, a right is the moral sanction of a positive of his freedom to act on his own judgment. 
for his own goals by his own voluntary, uncoerced choice. As to his neighbors, his rights impose no obligations on them except of a negative kind, to abstain from violating his rights. The right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is their only implementation. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. Since man has to sustain his life by his own effort, the man who has no right to the product of his effort has no means to sustain his life. The man who produces while others dispose of his product is a slave. Bear in mind that the right to property is a right to action like all the others. It is not the right to an object, but to the action and the consequences of producing or earning that object. It is not a guarantee that a man will earn any property, but only a guarantee that he will own it if he earns it. It is the right to gain, to keep, to use, and to dispose of material values. To violate man's rights means to compel him to act against his own judgment or to expropriate his values. Basically, there is only one way to do it, by the use of physical force. There are two potential violators of man's rights, the criminals and the government. The great achievement of the United States was to draw a distinction between these two by forbidding to the second the legalized version of the activities of the first. The Declaration of Independence laid down the principle that, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. This provided the only valid justification of a government and defined its only proper purpose, to protect man's rights by protecting him from physical violence. Thus, the government's function was changed from the role of ruler to the role of servant. The government was set to protect man from criminals, and the Constitution was written to protect man from the government. The Bill of Rights was not directed against private citizens, but against the government as an explicit declaration that individual rights supersede any public or social power. America's inner contradiction was the altruist collectivist ethics. Altruism is incompatible with freedom, with capitalism, and with individual rights. One cannot combine the pursuit of happiness with the moral status of a sacrificial animal. It was the concept of individual rights that had given birth to a free society. It was with the destruction of individual rights that the destruction of freedom had to begin. A collectivist tyranny dare not enslave a country by an outright confiscation of its values, material or moral. It has to be done by a process of internal corruption. Just as in the material realm the plundering of a country's wealth is accomplished by inflating the currency, so today one may witness the process of inflation being applied to the realm of rights. The process entails such a growth of newly promulgated rights that people do not notice the fact that the meaning of the concept is being reversed. Just as bad money drives out good money, so these printing press rights negate authentic rights. Potentially, a government is the most dangerous threat to man's rights. It holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force against legally disarmed victims. When unlimited and unrestricted by individual rights, a government is men's deadliest enemy. The term individual rights is a redundancy. There is no other kind of rights and no one else to possess them. Those who advocate laissez-faire capitalism are the only advocates of man's rights.